track just like a regular junior I just sit back and relax and pretty soon you're wondering how come I'm not already there although I've already won I hold on to my dreams I guess I'll see where it takes me I hold on I won't let go
Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Montclair. My name is Marcus Greyhawk. My pronouns are he, him and his. I serve as the Director of Music Ministries. It's good to be with you once again. 
If you are watching this service live on YouTube or Facebook, we invite you to share your name and type it into the chat, maybe also your location, and let us and each other know that you are here. We begin today's service by singing Stonecatcher, a new hymn composed by Carol Cowett. Carol serves as music director for White Bear UU Church in Minnesota. And this hymn won the first prize at the 2018 songwriting competition sponsored by the Association for Unitarian Universalist Music Ministries. Carol says it was inspired by a story in the book Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, the social justice activist and lawyer. Maybe you're familiar with the movie Just Mercy based on Brian Stevenson's life. It's quite incredible. So Stonecatcher was inspired by a story in his book. The hymns today will be led by our member Susie Roman Luna. One morning I woke up and knew what to do. I'd catch all the songs that everyone threw. I'd catch all the sorrow that I could in a day. And I'd take all the stones and I'd throw them away. Don't ask why I say we must all be free. Don't ask why I say you can count on me. Don't ask why I say we must all be free.
Today's service is titled, Summoning Better Angels, an Inauguration Elegy. Together we will explore Wednesday's peaceful transfer of power, examining concepts of liberty ancient and modern, while praying our new presidential administration approaches the hopes of unity, justice, accountability, and inclusion we feel are required to build beloved community. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, Whatever age, identity, history, ability, gender, or sexual orientation, you are welcome to bring your full self here. I am Reverend Scott Sandler Michael, he, him, and his. And I am Reverend Anya Sandler Michael, she, her, and hers. Grounded in faith, we come together to nurture the soul, inspire hope, and bring into being a more just and loving world. If you have school-aged children, please register for our innovative children's religious education program. If you are joining us at 10 a.m., please continue with us for a virtual connection cafe beginning at 11 a.m. Check your email and Realm announcements for the Zoom link. And keep an eye out for a special program tonight at 7 p.m. with our own Julia Crafton. It's time now to light our chalice, a beacon to guide us through these times together. Perhaps you have a chalice or candle at home, anything you can illumine. Let's light our collective chalices as we share our chalice lighting affirmation. Let us, Let us open, open our senses to take in the beauty. Let, Let us open our minds to learn what is true. And Let us open our hearts to love one another. This adapted invocation is from Rumi and translated by Coleman Barks. What is praised is one. So the praise is one too, many jugs being poured into a huge basin. All religions, all this singing one song. The differences, they're just illusion and vanity. Sunlight looks slightly different on this wall than it does on that wall, and a lot of different on this other one, but it's still one light. We have borrowed these clothes, these time and space personalities from a light, and when we praise, we pour them back in. Called now by this invocation into worship, we turn to seek a soft meditation, a deep reflection, an ardent prayer, each as we are called, yet mystically all together. And we enter into this space by hearing the lamentations, the request, and the remembrances of our community. Let us hear one another to heal one another. Owen and Kieran Wells light a candle of mourning for their grandfather, John Wells, who passed away on January 17th at the age of 80. They will always remember their pop-pop with love. Jane Gartner is sad to share that her brother, Lewis's wife, Terry Carraway, died on January 20th from COVID-19 in Loma Linda Hospital in addition to Lewis, Terry leaves two sons and Lewis's four children, two grandchildren, and many friends. Please hold this family in your heart. Foxy Pullen and Ann Tripp light a candle for Herm, Foxy's late husband and Ann's elder. January 25th is the eighth anniversary of his passing. They both miss him 
very much. Intern Ali lights a candle for their father, John, and his wife, Sarah. They have been admitted to the hospital with COVID-19. We light this candle for the over 400,000 Americans that have succumbed to COVID-19. Many of these were our elders, those gifted with the wisdom of years. We ache with this loss and pause in silent witness to their memory. And we light this final candle for the joys and sorrows that have not been spoken aloud. In the silence that follows, you are encouraged to speak the names of those you are holding in your prayers or meditations, or you are welcome to write them into the chat. May we hold this silence as this silence holds us. May our listening bring forth acts of love. Will you join with me in a spirit of prayer, in a spirit of focus, intention, and reflection? I welcome you to place your hand upon your heart, place your hand upon your heart, and feel the beating of your being the pulsing of your life. In this beating is the testament of our survival. It is the rhythm that has sustained even when the world on which we depend has shaken. It is the constancy that has remained even as the structures of our national experiment have shown themselves weak and unsteady. It is the vitality that has upheld even as the foundation of our livelihood has threatened collapse. Feel the persistence of your survival. Know it is a holy gift coupled with our communal will to live, a will that stems as much from our connections as our commitments to one another. Know your struggle. Know our struggle, know the challenge, and give praise for the beating of your heart and the beating of the hearts of our neighbors, which have sustained, which have upheld, which are here, present, among us, within us, for us, the beating of our hearts, which have sustained, give praise, we have survived, holy, holy, blessed beings, we have survived. Amen.
Help us keep on keeping on until we find the love, hope, and peace we need to bring about a more just and loving world for all. Hello, my name is Kira Pipkins. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the liturgist for today's service. We now turn to our offering. When you give to our offering, 80% of your gifts will care for the Unitarian Universalist congregation at Montclair, and 20% will support our justice recipient. Our January Sharing Our Riches recipient is RIP Medical Debt, Essex County, a campaign developed by the Montclair Interfaith Cler Clergy Association. Together, we have the opportunity to eliminate the medical debt for hundreds of families and individuals in Essex County. We will be helping families who earn less than two times the federal poverty level, have debts that are less than that are 5% or more of their annual income, and those whose debts are greater than their assets. Through this campaign, every dollar that we give will abolish $100 of medical debt. You can text to give, mail us a check, or go to our homepage and click on the donate button. This is a time of need. All of your gifts are worthy, and they are all received with love. Today's reading comes from The American Creed, a biography of the Declaration of Independence by the late UU minister, Rev. Dr. Forrest Church. Rev. Church reminds us of the many shortcomings of those who founded the United States, especially in the realms of gender and racial justice. Yet, the words they compose as the foundational creed of our nation are ideals mightier and more divine than the flawed human beings who wrote them. Church writes, Creeds have to be monumental, struck in metal that, when refined in the furnace of history and burnished by developing thought, can endure the trials of time, steadfast enough to redeem history itself. Creeds are spiritual touchstones. Although finished in fire, they are cool to the touch when handed from one generation to the next. Capturing the essence of the American experiment. The American creed affirms those truths our founders held as self-evident. Justice for all, because we are all created equal. Liberty for all, because we are all endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. America's fidelity to this creed is judged by history. Living up to it remains a constant challenge, but it invests our nation with a spiritual purpose and, if we honor its precepts, a moral destiny. The anthem that follows is We Rise from Batia Levine. Following in the path of her ancestors, Batia Levine uses a song as a tool for healing and resilience. She believes in the liberatory potential of song to loosen what is bound within each of us for the sake of all goodness. Batia wrote this song not long after the 2016 U.S. presidential election as a cry of resistance against the movement propelled by white supremacy and racism ascending to power. Batia and her crew recorded the song this last March in Philadelphia. It is our pleasure to share it in worship today. We rise, humbly hearted rise, won't be divided Here in hope, in prayer, 
wisdom rise Ancestors surround us rise In a hope, in prayer We find ourselves here In a hope, in prayer In hope, in prayer, we find ourselves here. In hope, in prayer, we find ourselves on the other side of an inauguration some feared might not happen. And I don't know if you're feeling it, but I am cautiously relieved in this moment. It is daunting to think we feared an election being overturned in these United States, something that according to the American creed is our birthright, to have the government we duly elected peacefully handed the reins of power. But alas, have we not trod a long and perilous journey? Had the horrors of tyranny and treason painted across our televisions and cell phones, learned how little regard some citizens and even some elected leaders have for our democracy, how they seem to banish their better angels. In hope, in prayer, we're right here. Thank God the American creed has proven resilient once more. Our Declaration of Independence teaches that a government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. The Declaration also mentions that our founding principles are derived from nature and nature's God. Principles like all are created equal. All have inalienable rights. The Declaration declares these bedrock American truths so powerful, so eternal, that they are self-evident. They need no further proof than being spoken aloud. The Declaration also declares, since we all have been endowed with divinity and liberty by our Creator, no human being can justly deprive us of those rights. America's founding principles show our republic unites the sacred and the secular. We are best governed by principles vested with divinity. Despite these sacred aspirations, this week's inauguration came after an insurrection like none seen since the Civil War. Indeed, it is fit and proper that we call to mind the Confederacy when explaining the treason of January 6th. 
The terrorists who stormed our capital believed lies which conveniently upheld white supremacy and sanctioned hatred of those unlike them. Was this not the predictable result of a rogue presidential administration that can be seen as an attempt to establish a second confederacy? Why else would they say there were good people on both sides of the Unite the Right march in Charlottesville? Why else would they decry the removal of statues dedicated to traitors and racists? This was who their leaders were all along. Civil War revisionists furthering white supremacy. And this, my friends, is why we are dedicated to adopting the eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism. The eighth principle makes dismantling white supremacy a faith imperative. This is a generational effort beginning in our hearts as it transforms all public and private institutions. Sacred goals need secular champions. President Biden made a strong case Wednesday for unity. Politics does not have to be a raging fire destroying everything in its path, Biden preached. Every disagreement does not have to be a cause for total war. We must reject the culture to which facts themselves are manipulated and manufactured. But unity is no easy task. Unity is enabled by accountability. Let us recall what happened in Michigan, where for the last decade, lawmakers made it legal to disregard the vote of entire cities and counties with black populations, of course. And this assault on democracy resulted in nothing short of the poisoning of thousands of people in the city of Flint. Michigan's Republican governor appointed a manager who overrode the will of the duly elected city council of Flint, changing the source of Flint's water from the Detroit Water Authority to untreated water straight from the Flint River. Water long known as heavily polluted with arsenic, chromium, and lead. The result was that an entire generation of children in Flint were exposed to heavy chemicals that will forever compromise their health. This is how the new confederacy functions. An oligarchy of greedy, self-appointed white overseers overriding the will of the people. And such infamy always leads to death and sadly more so for black and brown people. Unity is only enabled with accountability. Indeed, these new confederates despise the sacred truths enshrined in our declaration just as those Confederates in 1861 did. Alexander Stevens, vice president of the Confederacy, wrote that the Declaration's ideals of human liberty are fundamentally wrong. He said the Confederacy is founded upon exactly the opposite ideal on which the Declaration's foundations are laid. Slavery, Stevens proudly proclaimed, is the natural and normal state of the world. Bosh. That confederacy was vanquished in a war that claimed more American lives than any other. This is why confederate statuary is removed from public land. No public space should ever honor racist treachery. By contrast, Joe Biden's inauguration was an exercise in universalism, championing our sacred American creed. About the American creed, Forest Church teaches, America is a union of faith and freedom, in which faith elevates freedom and freedom tempers faith. SAS G.K. Chesterton once famously sang, America is a nation with the soul of a church. And what has evolved in the United States, despite white supremacy, is a diverse pluralistic, multicultural gumbo of people so various that the only thing that promotes truth and promises protection is a secular universalism, one enshrined in Barack Obama's second inaugural address when he called into the circle of citizenship those of all faiths and those of no faith. 
Obama also hailed the toil for liberty by those from Seneca Falls, Selma, and Stonewall, thereby uplifting gender equality, racial equality, and LGBTQ freedom in one sweet phrase. This is the only road approaching the promises of liberty contained in our founding documents. The American Creed also sings through the 13th and the 14th Amendments to our Constitution. These amendments abolish slavery, but also demand that all the effects and residue of slavery be abolished and reparations made. They also proclaim equal protection under the law as the primary value in all public policy decisions. And sadly, as we know, these two amendments have largely been ignored and they are openly assaulted by the new Confederacy championed by the previous administration. Unity is enabled by accountability. The sacred needs secular champions. You know, there's an easy way to remind ourselves and those who denigrate the American creed of the highest ideals of our national life. Take out a dollar bill, a one dollar bill, go ahead, and turn it so you see its back. Now on either flank of the word one, you'll see the two sides of the great seal of the United States. And on the right is an eagle. Above its head, 13 stars, one for each of the original colonies. The eagle clutches an olive branch and arrows, but the eagle looks towards the olive branch, suggesting we favor peace, even if we're prepared to defend. On the left of the one, you will see a pyramid built by human hands, but with no capstone on top. In the capstone's place is the all-seeing eye, an ancient Masonic image for divinity. The phrase, anuit coeptus, hovers around the eye, implying God favors our undertaking. Below the pyramid are the Latin words, novus ordo seculorum, a new order of the ages has commenced, secular and sacred united. And in the center above the word one is the phrase on all our currency, in God we trust. And above the eagle's head are the words, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. The American creed is universalist. All are created equal, equal justice under the law for all. Indeed, the sacred and the secular unite in our nation's founding ideals, its documents, and its symbology. It's enshrined on something as common as a $1 bill. And in this inauguration season, we are reminded once again, it is our duty to move the reality of our secular world closer to the promise of the sacred ideals our founding documents outline for our government by, of, and for the people. In his first inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln famously appealed to the better angels of our nature, so the chorus of union may swell again. We need those better angels now, don't we? Like Joe Biden's call for unity, Lincoln wasn't asking for traitors to be left off the hook. He was asking all Americans to rise up and embrace a universal commitment to equality and democracy. Lincoln called for all human beings to be brought into the circle of protection, freedom, and prosperity. He reminded us that this land belongs to all of us, and all means all. Amen. Will you reflect with me? How will we inspire our leaders to be governed by the better angels of their natures? How will we hold accountable those who profane the sacred secular mission of our nation? Our closing hymn, This Land is Your Land, was written by Woody Guthrie. 
Woody Guthrie is a hero of mine, a man of the people, and a dedicated freedom fighter. This land, this America, is only what America can be when the full beauty of our pluralistic, multicultural identity is affirmed, when those who too often marginalized can truly feel safe, knowing that they can call this America their land. Wednesday, President Biden asked Amanda Gorman, a 22-year-old black woman from Los Angeles, to share her ample gifts of vision and verse. These words from her poem, The Hill We Climb, are a fitting benediction for us this day. The hill we climb, if only we dare it, because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. May we live into the beauty, these sacred and secular notions promise. Our worship has ended. Let our service begin. Go in peace. Go in joy. Go in Join us right after this for Connection Cafe. And come back tonight at 7 p.m. for our own Julia Crafton's record release party. And until we meet again virtually 
or otherwise. You are in our hearts. Yes, he was too fast Maybe some good things are too good to last My big sister didn't go and join the Navy They say she's crazy, but I'm thinking that maybe She might even see the world Gotta go through some oysters if you're looking for pearls And hold on
Werden wir vielleicht. What you do for me You got my heart To sing in What you've done for me Snapping words are happening to me. What you've done for me, you got the fire burning. What you've done for me, you got the Strings drumming, drums drumming, summons humming, song is coming over me. <laughs> yes, indeed. Don't ask why I keep sticking my thumb into this pie. My, oh my, what a lucky girl. Such a very lucky girl, am I? 